Hi, my name is Nicola Jennings. I'm director of Colnagi Foundation. Welcome to Colnagi Foundation Lates, talks with interesting people about new art exhibitions, publications and events in the UK and around the world. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Stephanie Archangel. Stephanie is a junior curator at the Rijksmuseum and she co-curated with Elmer Kolflin, who's an art historian at the University of Amsterdam, an exhibition which is on in Amsterdam at the moment called Black in Rembrandt's Time. So Stephanie was born in Curaçao, the former Dutch Antilles, and has lived in the Netherlands for, for quite some time and is a sociologist by training. Tell us about the exhibition and why you wanted to, to do it. I was working at the Rembrandt house and was walking around at the Maurits house, which is in Den Haag, and saw the two Africans from Rembrandt. For me, that was the first time that I saw black people painted in a worthy setting, um, proud, proudly looking back, broad shoulders. Um, it was actually the first time I saw black people portrayed in that way in the 17th century. So if Rembrandt was mostly known uh, as someone who painted to life, would that not also cover black people? It turned out it, it was so. Um, so for me, it, it, it mostly started as a question. Um, is there a different way that black people were portrayed in that 17th century that I have no idea about because I'm used to this perspective or perception of black people in a stereotypical way. That's really interesting. At Kolnagi Foundation, one of the things we're very keen to try to do is finding works of art which have relevance to people, especially young people today. And, and, I, and I'm very conscious that this is one of the issues. You know, when we look around in galleries, there are relatively few images of black people, but when we see them, they tend to be small, they tend to be secondary characters, they tend to be slaves or servants, don't they? And so I can imagine that for somebody like you that's going around a gallery, that must be a quite a kind of distressing experience. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. No, absolutely. It was distressing because I saw this, this first time that I saw uh, black people n not in the background, not not being I enslaved or, or not being um, servants, uh, but standing right in the middle of that painting. It was this strong thing that this existed and I had no idea of it. So why do we think Rembrandt painted this? I mean, do we know who these men are and why they're dressed in the way they are? Yes and no. And to be honest, that uh, the 17th century is very difficult when it comes down to finding out who these black people that are portrayed here actually were. Mark Ponte, one of the researchers uh, who worked on the exhibition with us and worked on the catalogue, did find ideas of who these two men might have been, but you can't trace them back for sure. There were a lot of black people living in Rembrandt's neighborhood, so it could have actually been anyone. It could have been, been one of his neighbors whom we see here. There were about 100 black people living in Amsterdam. There were about 200,000 people. So it's not a big percentage, but it's, I mean, it's not that they weren't there. Uh, they were very much visible and they weren't enslaved, as you would first think. In the Netherlands, uh, slavery wasn't legal. It was legal in the colonies, but it wasn't legal in the, du in the Dutch Republic itself. So you actually had a law stating every man living in the Netherlands uh, is free um, and if they have a slave owner keeping them, they can take them up to court and ask for their freedom. It's a bit complex because even though it was illegal to enslave people in the Netherlands, uh, it doesn't mean that it didn't take place in the households. But at the same time, you had a community of African people living in the Netherlands at that time who were free. Just part of the society. And is that one of the keys, do you think, to these depictions of them? You know, they were depicted like anybody else. They were, they were subjects like other subjects. Yeah, I think there are three main reasons. First of all, at that point, Amsterdam became the center of the world. So 
uh, people all over the world found their way to the Netherlands, merchants. Secondly, the idea or the concept or the construct that comes with transatlantic slavery, it didn't predominate the ideas of how we perceive black people yet. And third, uh, and foremost, I think maybe the most interesting part is that it was a period where artists were just painting, not from the imagination or their fantasies, but the true trick of being a good and great artist was to paint through life. Uh, so for them, it, it was asking their neighbors to sit down and model for them and, and, and pay them f for that. Um, it was to portray them as real as possible, as they were doing with white people. Nevertheless, there was still an element of fantastic costumes. Rembrandt did that with everybody, including himself, didn't he? He loved to dress up and he dressed everybody up. And this is, here's one by Perit Dao who is a Rembrandt's pupil. Yeah, it's a trony. So in that sense, tronies are all all made of, out of imagination. And they're made for sale on the market. So, so they need to be decorative, right? Yeah, the artist used a real life model. And then he imagined his outfit around him as a trony of a boy with an arrow who would be white, would be the same way. There's no much difference in in that sense so these aren't really about exoticizing the, these are just making attractive portraits to sell on the market yes people nowadays say well it's so sad that you don't have that these paintings are anonymous all tronies are anonymous so, it is also necessary to treat them as the same then we have this portrait of don miguel de castro who was the emissary of the the king of the congo yeah which is a real, a real portrait. He's a very controversial man in the sense that what you see here is proper black elite in that 17th century. He's an ambassador who is highly um, powerful and who actually goes to the Dutch Brazil first and then comes to the, to the Netherlands for alliances uh, with the Dutch. In, fight, in fighting of the Portuguese, Johan Mauritz, or, or so the story goes, appoints a painter to paint these three portraits. Crazy enough, it's the only paintings in that whole 17th century that are portraits and that we actually know whom they are. First name, last name. Because we've got the, the portraits of his two servants. Pedro Sunda and Diego Bemba. For me, to be honest, it was very difficult in choosing um, it, if, if I would show them in the exhibition because of how controversial they are. It's like, imagine actually finding out whom these people are and finding out that they also were selling other human beings. They were part of the slave trade. Yeah, yeah. they were part of the slave trade and, and, and therefore part of that horrible system that, yeah, uh, contributed to the stereotyping of black people. It's also history. Um, uh, it's also the reality um, that history carries with it. And it's also the only thing you have as a black person to getting close to a portrait with a name and a last name. And it's funny because you know more about who these people are than you do about the painter, I think. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Which never comes up. <laughs> In that sense, it really holds the complexity of looking at this history when it comes to people of African descent. Um, it tells a lot and it takes away a lot at the same time. But that's important to tell the whole story. Maybe it's because I come from a very much post-colonial island. I've never known differently than slavery has been part of who I am and our existence as, as a small, small island. Um, as black people, you know this, you know, we carry that with us all the time, even if you don't want to. So changing that perspective of not only always having everything being reduced when it comes to your history, 
to slavery, uh, which is, it's, I mean, for me, something scary to say out loud, but I wanted to show we are more than just people who once were enslaved with this exhibition. I can actually show you that in between 1620 and 1660, when slavery wasn't part of this big transnational money-making machine, we were actually normal and being portrayed in the arts. This whole concept of who also we see ourselves as has been constructed and completely wiped out of what we once were and actually still are. So it's also trying to show it's like a small breath of fresh air to me to get in that small space and be like, ah, I can breathe now because I can push away all that stereotypical nonsense that has been added to whom I am by uh, slavery and then realizing that I can't properly let that go because it's so intertwined with my history. It comes back in, in Don Miguel de Castro. I mean, I can't, you can't only show the positive without showing the negative, but it's also nice to focus on that positive because most things are focused on that negative. Yes, absolutely. I think you give us a, an insight into the full range of the types of images. And in fact, your, your chapter in the catalog is, is entitled as if they were mere beasts. There's always been an, a concept of superiority when it comes to Europe, and that has existed way back. I mean, it's, it's a 400 years after Christ, and you already find these concepts of Africa um, and what Africa is, these people are. So that exoticism has always been there. The superiority idea has also always been there. Um, but that's in that 17th century um, when the Dutch start to have their own colonies and then begin um, taking part in that transatlantic slave trade themselves. They start slowly but surely to legitimize why they are enslaving these human beings and start almost changing their concepts of what Africa is prior. They actually still see Africa as a continent and they see their societies as being in a hierarchy. When the Dutch start to have their own colonies, it becomes this homogeneous concept of not a continent, but a land. Um, whom have exotic people who are cannibals and they're animals and they're beasts. It's easier to enslave animals or people you have a bad perspective of th than human beings. It's just easier to process. This is what happens after 1660. Is it that there's more slavery in, in the Dutch colonies at that point? Yeah, I mean, around 1640s, the Dutch start engaging in slavery. So you see that changing uh, through time. And around 1660 is, is around the period where it really uh, becomes uh, a booming business for the Dutch. And, then, and that's when we begin to see these types of images and the images of the woman at her toilet with the black slave servant behind her. Either that, or we see the images of the black magi, for example, or of, of black figures in religious paintings. Yeah, um, I mean, if you look at paintings like the black magi... These are paintings that are made as of the 16th century, but as of the 17th century, they really become an accessory to white people. They don't have uh, roles in biblical stories anymore. They have roles in, in, in households. They become objects that can sell other objects. Um, for example, they, be, they start uh, being associated with, with sugar or tobacco. And, and you also have them as servants in service of the white person. Who's, it, it's not always that they actually had those in their households. It just became part of enriching your status.
I also wanted to, to talk about these slightly earlier images. Rembrandt rather idolized Rubens. What I see is an artist really, really doing his best to capture this black person. One must imagine that even though black people were there in the Netherlands and um, in Europe, they still were something different. And if we look at it only from an artist's perspective, it was something new. It was a challenge. It was difficult because as one knows, light shines differently on the skin of a black person. The hair is differently. Uh, so how do you get this as real as possible? I, I, I see him challenging Rembrandt, to be honest, like try, try to do better. Well, I think it's a particularly important time to have this conversation. It's a very poignant moment. I think that there might be much more. Um, I think it's just what questions we ask of these paintings.